Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about New Jerusalem, talking about the Third Temple, talking about the 144,000, the New Covenant, maybe even the Rapture. Yep, in this video, we're going to cover a lot of information, including my own testimony on how I discovered the Book of the Covenant, and even further evidence how I know that the Third Temple will come down in the year 2020. I'm going to show you how I cracked the code of the 364 day year. Some of you guys are really into Bible codes. Well, I'm going to show you several encoded messages that were right in front of our eyes the whole time for everybody to see, which was probably why we never saw them at all. We're going to talk about dates in the Bible and why they're given. And how they show a pattern on certain kinds of events happening on the same day throughout the Bible. So stay tuned. Like I said, we got a lot to go over in this video. But if you bear with me, I'm sure it'll be really interesting. And that verse that we're going to come out of is Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Now I wanted to take the time to look at several different translations of this verse to try to make sure that we get a good understanding of what it's talking about here. So let's jump over here and look at it from the King James Version. This is Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now this is a misunderstood verse I believe. Because there's some who believe that this is the Antichrist. While there's others who believe that this is the Messiah. Now, I tend to go with those who believe that this is the Messiah only because in verse 26 is talking about the Messiah. And verse 26 is talking about the Messiah and how he will be cut off. And there's no transition that he's talking about anybody else in verse 27. So I'm of that group who believes that this covenant that's being made is being made by the Messiah to his disciples. Now there's a lot of people who reject this idea. Especially people who reject the idea of the covenant. Believe it or not there are a lot of believers out there. Who want nothing to do with the father's covenants. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. And what it boils down to. They don't want to obey anything in the scripture whatsoever. These are the same people that come and try to say that the Messiah did away with all of the laws and all of the rules. And a lot of time I'll ask these people, well, do you obey any rule in the Bible at all? And they never reply to that because it makes them think for a minute. Well, why do we have a Bible if we're not going to obey any of the rules? No. The covenants of the Father is extremely important. All covenants that we've ever gotten are still in effect even unto this day. There are eight covenants total. Nine if you include the new covenant, the covenant that we are still waiting on. But all of the covenants that we have gotten up to this date are still in effect. That's why people are still getting circumcised. That's why we still don't eat blood. That's why there's still a rainbow in the sky. These covenants are still in effect. But you look right here and it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, this is where my speculation is going to come in, because I believe I understand what he's talking about when he says he's going to confirm this covenant for one week. Now, I have to give a little bit of my testimony here. I hope you don't mind. But back there in the year 2014, I was introduced to the covenant. Now, I have been what you would call a Bible scholar since about 1995 when I read the entire Bible three times back to back and then went on to read just about every scriptural document I can find, including the Apocrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Lost Books of the Bible, Forgotten Books of the Bible. I even read half of the Mormons Bible and the Koran and a lot of other books that you probably never even heard of. But one thing you should know. Reading the Bible, even being a Bible scholar, does not mean that you're obeying the Bible or living the Bible. And I wasn't. It wasn't until the year 2014 that I actually started moving to being obedient to the scripture. Now, it was in 2014, which I believe was a sabbatical year, that I made the transition from corporate America where I was a 
quality assurance manager in a nuclear power plant to a homesteader on the hillbilly homestead which is what I am now it was in 2014 that this huge transition was made right around the spring of 2014 but in the fall of 2014 was when something big actually happened in my life and in the lives of my entire family there in about September or so of 2014 I found myself explaining to my children and my wife how I had always tried to do the holy feast found in the Bible including the Sabbath day but I had never slept in a tent according to Leviticus 23 and the Feast of Tabernacles I had never done that I had never been out in a booth I had never kept that one up and I really didn't know anything about it well I give credit to my son Christian who at the time said well dad I want to do it he was about 13 or 14 at the time and he wanted to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. He wanted to actually sleep in a tent during Tabernacles. And so I agreed and we went off and we bought a tent and him and I, when the Feast of Tabernacles showed up, him and I went, actually went out there in a four person tent and actually slept out there on the first night of Tabernacles. Then on the second night of Tabernacles, my twin boys wanted to come out and they wanted to sleep in a tent on the third night of tabernacles my daughter and one of her cousins actually wanted to sleep in a tent too that was the third and the fourth night so we ended up having to purchase another tent because my wife wanted to come out there too me and Christian slept in the four person tent while they all slept in a bigger 12 person tent and on the fifth night, our entire family slept out in that 12-person tent. And on the sixth night, we had a huge tornado. My daughter and I actually heard that tornado about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It sounded like a train was actually coming out of the sky, coming towards our tent. I mean, it literally did sound like a train rushing towards us, except it was coming from the sky we couldn't see it because we were in a tent but we could definitely hear it well turns out it was a tornado that struck our area which actually killed a few people in our area well needless to say this was this ordeal was a, a life-changing experience it was after that event that I realized that it wasn't my house that protected me it was actually the father that is the protection there I was face to face with a tornado in a flimsy little Walmart tent but yet my family was spared thanks to the father who was our protection and ever since this day I've felt invincible like nothing can touch me I don't need a house I don't need a car I don't need money I don't need anything that the world provides as long as I am in favor with the father who is my protector well it was after this event that a lot of things started to change in our life I mean a lot of things started to change in our life including being made of the book of the covenant now how that all happened was at the time I was preparing to do these type of classes I was preparing to be an online presence or an online personality or something like that and what I was doing was I was making phone calls to a web radio station called blog talk radio and talking to individuals out in California about natural law now part of their show was they would allow people to call in and talk about biblical law and how it relates to natural law and I would call in as a defense for the Christians. There wasn't a lot of people calling in who was claiming to have faith in biblical law. And even the ones who did, didn't have a lot of knowledge in that biblical law. So I would call in and add my input, bring those guys to scriptural truths about some of the stuff that they were talking about. 
And in one of their debates, they was talking about the book of Eli. Now, I got a little bit confused, I must admit, because I didn't remember what the book of Eli was. And I started searching my library looking for the book of Eli. And when I couldn't find a book on my shelf that had the book of Eli in it, I jumped on the web and started looking to see if maybe I hadn't acquired that book yet. And I didn't find anything. So then I jumped on a search engine kind of like this one and I started looking up the book of Eli I found this verse over in Nehemiah 12 but it was talking about Eliashib but then after I gave up on that I started looking okay what if there's something in there just says of Eli maybe it goes by something else maybe it's not called a book of Eli and I found several hits in there a lot of which were related to the sons of Eli, who wasn't a whole bunch of good dudes. They wasn't a bunch of good dudes. But I kept trying to find out because I wanted to know, you know, you know, try to be comprehensive. And I wanted to know what these guys were talking about, the book of Eli. And so I put in the phrase book of to see what I would come up with. And what I came up with was the book of the covenant. Now, I got real interested to know what is this book of the covenant? By then, I had read the book of Exodus six or seven times, but I hadn't recognized that there was such thing as the book of the covenant. So then I jumped on Google and looked up the book of the covenant to try to figure out what is the book of the covenant. Now, I wish I could find the exact website that I had found that day because it was extremely helpful let me know that the book of the covenant is found in Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23 is actually the covenant, the first covenant given to Moses on Mount Horeb. And so that was the way the father actually introduced me to the book of the covenant. That was in 2014. So 2014 was an extremely important year for me, and I believe it was for a lot of other individuals, maybe yourself included, because not only did I start actually keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, as you read over there in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 40 through 43, but I actually started reading the Book of the Covenant and obeying the other rules in that covenant. Once I realized that it was a covenant, the covenant, I actually started doing the best I could to actually keep up with it. Well, the thing is, I believe that this has happened to all of us. Like we was talking about earlier about the eighth parable, similar to eight. I believe it was actually in 2014 that I received my rod. Now, if you haven't read that chapter or if you haven't looked at that video, you may not know what I'm talking about, about the rod from the willow tree. That willow tree rod is actually the law given to the believers. And I believe I received my rod back there in 2014. But now notice this part about this table that I'm looking at here. You guys may have seen this table before in a previous video. Notice how I have months and days related to years over here. As it turns out, the prophetic year, 364 a day year, even though you may not be able to make sense from year to year or to line up to the Gregorian calendar, when you actually lay that thing out with one day equal in one year, it actually lines up perfectly. For instance, when you go back and you look at the exact day that the Messiah was born, he was born on the first day of the first month. But when you go all the way back to Adam, you see that Adam was born on the first day of the first month. When you look at Daniel's 2300 year prophecy. When Daniel was telling us that the second coming of the Messiah should have occurred. It falls on the same day that we received the covenant back there in the book of Exodus. The sixth day of the third month, give or take a few months, understanding that the Father's calendar and the Gregorian calendar doesn't line up perfectly. This is amazing. 
Now, you may have seen in some of my videos how I talk about this Enoch calendar that my sons and I made up based on the book of Enoch, chapter 72, 73. I think it is the uh, called the book of the luminaries or something like that. Now, you notice that I have all of the biblical references that we find in our scripture on this calendar. Now, when you look over there at the far left, that half moon there, that's the first month. And when you come around and you look at the sixth month, and you look at the events that happened on the sixth month, you can see that there was something in Haggai 1 and 1 and Ezekiel 8 and 1 that referenced those days in the sixth month. Here are all of the events in the seventh month. I first pulled out all of these verses way back in college in about 1998. And I have been looking at these dates for years, thinking that somehow these days would line up with the days of the month according to the Hebrew calendar. But they never really did. For instance, we're right here in the fourth month. And when you go and you look at the calendar close to see the event that happened closest to today, you end up with Jeremiah, and it looks like chapter 39, verse 8, if I can read my handwriting, and a couple of more verses. And so what I would do is I would come in and I would actually look those scriptures up every time we got close to one of those days. And then when we fell on that day, I would actually look for something to occur similar to what the scripture was saying that was had happened in the past according to that day. But what I'm understanding now is those scriptural days are not according to the month, but they actually line up with the years. And so we were supposed to go in and make these days line up with the years throughout history. For instance, when you come and you look at the captivity that took place back there in 606, of course it falls in the fifth month. Who could have thought it would have happened in any other month besides the fifth month? And looks like it was just before the seventh day of Av in the fifth month. You see that the decree to rebuild was given on or about the fifth day of the eleventh month. Then we see that the temple was actually rebuilt on the twelfth day of the eleventh month. And here is another event in 312 when Constantine actually did his little thing over there when he tricked the Israelites that took place in 312 AD and that was on the 11th month and the 12th day of the month as well like I said give or take a year now but let's go back and look at that yeah it falls on the same day that they rebuilt the temple the 11th day of the 12th month in 417 BC 417 BC I don't know how to say this correctly, but 417 B.C. is the same day as 312. One time they was actually rebuilding the temple. Then the other time was when they actually ended the disciples ministry there and started what we know as the Catholic Church in 312. Now, that is the actual day that Noah sent out the raven. When he had opened the ark there in Genesis chapter 8, he opened a window to the ark and sent out the raven. When you add up the days, you'll see that that happened on the 12th day of the 11th month. Look at this. <laughs> this is amazing. You look at the end of their captivity. They got out of captivity in 536. That lines up with the 14th day of the 7th month. I believe this table actually cracks the code of the 364 day year. In this table, I have cracked Daniel's 1,290 day timeline, his 1,335 day timeline, his 490 day or his 70 week timeline. The Bible is extremely accurate. 
And all you have to do is put faith in it and let the Bible be the driver. Do some reverse engineering. Trust in what the Bible says over everything else, including your own ideas and understandings. And it makes everything line up perfectly. Well, come back and look what happened in the seventh month. You see right here, the seventh month, the first day of the month would have been in the year 2000. Lasted from 2000 to 2001. You say, well, the first day of the seventh month is the memorial of blowing of trumpets. What could have possibly occurred in that year that would signify such an event? The memorial of blowing of trumpets? Well, you have to remember the destruction of the Twin Towers. That event happened on that day. And then you see over here where I have other verses that line up. These are all events that line up with the seventh month and the first day of the month. And then you come down, you say, well, OK, that was trumpets. What would have occurred on atonement day if that was the first day of the month? What occurred on the tenth day of the month, which would have been 2009 to 2010? You have to remember the Haitian earthquake, the earthquake in Haiti that killed more than a quarter of a million people. And then if you jump over there to Jubilees 34 and 12, you see a correlation between those events that happen on the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. So you keep going and you look what occurs on the 15th day of that fourth month. Well, of course, that was the time when the tabernacling period started, I believe, for me. And maybe a lot of other people around the world. Now, some may have started this tabernacling period a little bit later. But from the comments that I get on my channel, a lot of people started their tabernacling period in 2014. A lot of people experienced life changing events in 2014, including being introduced to the covenant and or losing jobs or a lot of other events that when you think about it points to this covenant building period. So this is what I believe Daniel was talking about over here in verse 27 of chapter 9 when he says he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. I believe this is the week that he's talking about in 2014. And you say, well, what is the significance of this? OK, when you look at this covenant period being started in 2014, that will be the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. 2015 will be the second day. 2016 will be the third day of the Feast of Tabernacles, bringing you all the way to 2020 being the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then when you look at the events in the scripture that happened on the 21st day of the seventh month in 2020, you end up in Haggai chapter 2, which is a prophecy that was given to Haggai on the 21st day of the month. But in this prophecy, you hear about Zerubbabel. Now, you guys, please jump down there in the comment section because y'all know more about Zerubbabel than I do. I get comments about this guy all the time. But what stood out to me in this prophecy is how down here in verse 6, he says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea. I believe the Father is telling me that he's going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea in 2020. Not only does Haggai point to it, but then when you go over there and you look in the Shepherd of Hermas and similar to 9 verses 61 and 63, it talks about the tower being completed during that time. And we recognize the tower as being the true church or the 144,000 or New Jerusalem or the third temple. When you line Hermas up according to this table, it tells us that the tower will be complete also in the year 2020. So this is that covenant week that we're being built. This is why so many are actually out there trying to relearn the law over this time period. It's because the covenant is being built back on our hearts with the culmination going to be in the year 2020 when we have the marriage supper 
and we get the new covenant where the covenant won't be written on paper anymore, but it would actually be written on our hearts. I believe that this is telling us that this events, these events are going to happen in the year 2020. All starting back there in 2014. But now when you look over here and you see how my family and our tabernacling occurred over that week. I think that lines up with how it has occurred for all of humanity. Where you had the young in faith, the, the, the innocent ones actually came out on the first day in 2014. And then over time you had more and more people that's actually got in this covenant building period. And then it's actually going to be a big deal in the year 2020. I believe that these people have all been getting united around the law in 2020. Now, I use that language because when you look over here in the third testament of the Bible, in chapter 5 and verse 7, look what it says. It says, when those chosen by me find themselves reunited in the law, the earth and the stars will be shaken. And in the sky there will be signs. Because at that instant, the voice of the divine spirit surrounded by the spirits of the just of the prophets and of the martyrs will judge the spiritual and material realms. This is what I believe is going to happen at the end of this tabernacling period. At the end of this week. At the end of this covenant building week. Just like Haggai chapter 2 is saying. Just like Hermes similar to 9 is saying. And even the third testament of the Bible seems to be pointing to the heavens and the earth being shaken about that time. See how the Third Testament says reunited around my law. When you look over here at Second Ezra chapter two and jump down to verse thirty-eight, it's talking about the chosen being sealed at the Lord's feast. It says, Arise and stand up and see the number of those who have been sealed at the Lord's feast. So it is at the feast that we receive our sealing, so it should be easy to understand that. It is at the feast we are reunited around the law. The thing about the feast days, guys, and the Sabbath day, those are the only way that you could tell the Father's true people. I mean, you have this book of rules. There's almost 613 rules in the Old Testament. But most of those rules are don't do rules. Don't kill people. Don't lie to people. Don't eat sharks and eagles. Well, you can imagine how many people there are in the world that won't eat a rat. Well, because you won't eat a rat, does that make you the Lord's people? You can't tell from that. See, those don't pass the dead man test. Meaning, a dead man won't eat a rat. A dead man won't eat a shark. So that doesn't pass the dead man test at all. No, in order for you to prove to the Father, to yourself, and anybody else that cares to know that you are the Lord's people, you have to be doing something. You have to, when the, when the Bible tells you to do something, those are the only ways to tell. Like, for instance, the Ten Commandments. It tells you don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't take the Lord's name in vain, don't covet. But there's really only a few in there that are due commands. Honor the Sabbath day and honor your parents. When you're trying to see somebody obedient to the law, you can't really go with the negative commands. The commands telling you not to do something. You have to look at the commands that are telling you to do something. And the main ones in the Bible that are telling you to do something are the Sabbath day. Are the feast days. Are the holy days. So that's the significance, I believe, of the feast days. That's when we are sealed at the feast days is because those are days when we actually have to do something. You actually have to get up and make an effort to do the Sabbath day or to do the feast day. And so that's why I believe the scripture is telling us that we will be sealed at those feasts. And that, I believe, is what the, de what the Third Testament is telling us over there in verse 7 of chapter 55. It's when all of those people, all of these people, his chosen, find themselves reunited around these feast days, reunited around the law. When they actually are keeping these feast days, 
we're actually going to see these skies shaking and the earth shaking and these earthquakes and stuff go on. And these same people will start to take advantage of some of these celebrations that's done in the eighth day. That, I believe, will start after this covenant week is over. You see, it goes from 21 through 22. Well, sometime between the year 20 and 21, we can expect this huge earthquake. And then after that, we can go over there and look at these other verses that are talked about that will happen in the next year. For instance, in 1 Kings 8 and 66, where he said, he, And on the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went unto their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. Sure, the rest of the world is going to be in chaos and going through a lot of pain and trouble. But you got to remember that the Father's people have already been going through pain and been going through trouble. And he promises that he's not going to make us have to do it twice. We've already done it once. We've already made sacrifices. We've already suffered hardship and hunger and persecutions and pains and illnesses and all kinds of stuff. And he says that, you know, we, we're not going to have to go through that two times. You know, the rest of the world are enjoying themselves now having a huge party. Well, they get they shot to go through some of the stuff that we've been going through. And that's what I believe is talking about when he says those people are going to go away into their tents joyful. You look over there at Second Chronicles chapter 9. 7 and verse 9 it says and in the eighth day made a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days I believe these are the seven days that are ending now at the end of 2020 and then you look at Nehemiah verse 18 from chapter 8 it says also day by day from the first day unto the last they read in the book of the law and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. So this is what we've been doing for the past seven years, is reading in the book of the law. I'm sure I'm not the only one that has been doing this. I'm sure that there are others who have been getting acquainted with this law. But let me, but let me remind you of the parable of the laborers, that it doesn't matter if you started this covenant building back there in 2014 or if you're going to start it here in 2020 we're all going to get the same prize as long as you actually do start that's the message behind the parable of the laborers you remember that parable where that where he brought several guys out into his vineyard to do some work brought some out early in the morning some out in the midday and some out in the late day with only one hour to work but at the end of the day they all got the same pay well some of us started in 2014 some of us started in 2017 with the revelations 12 is sign in the sky and some of us are going to start here in 2020 but we're all going to end up with that same penny as long as we find ourselves reunited in the law so i just wanted to share that little bit of speculation with you guys please add your comments below I know you guys have something to say about it. Maybe you have something you can add or some clarification or anything you have. Any questions or anything you have, please put them in the comment section below. And if you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit the dislike button. Pray for us and shalom.